Do you feel it? Energy level was way up here all week long. I don't know what has happened. <laughs> but we want to turn to the word of the Lord this morning. God is good, and he has good things for us from the word of God. But as we turn to the word this morning, would you join me just a minute? Let's turn again to the Lord in prayer. And would you say, Lord, here is my heart, and let your words go into my heart and produce fruit. And would you say, Lord, let me be part of blessing in this church this morning. Let me not be a hindrance. Let me be a blessing. Shall we pray together this morning? Hallelujah. Lord, this morning we turn to your word. God, we thank you that as we look at your word, that it's not the words of man, that it is not empty human philosophies that make us think a lot but bring no life. It's not a lie. It's not something that some person somewhere or some group somewhere has made up and brought together. But Lord, as we look at your word, your words to us are life. Hallelujah. We thank you, God, that as we come to your word, oh, Father, your word through the power of your spirit has the ability and the purpose and the goal of transforming of our lives, of making a difference in our lives, of changing us, of giving us light, of inspiring us, of setting our feet upon a strong path, of strengthening our faith, of changing things that need to be changed, correcting areas that need to be corrected. Hallelujah. Lord, we come to you this morning and we ask, O oh God, by the power of your spirit that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word this morning morning. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask for your authority to be demonstrated against every other earthly power or authority that would stand against you, against any spirit of division, Lord, against any spirit of control or discouragement that would keep us from setting our eyes and our gaze upon you this morning. Oh God, we look to you this morning and we ask that you be lifted up, that you be glorified, that your purposes for this time this morning as we have gathered in your name, that they would be fully carried out in our lives and in our gathering this morning. We call upon you, O Lord, and we pray in the name of the one who has defeated sin, death, and hell, and who is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for his children. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 We continue this morning with power, preaching, persecution, and prayer. We, this is our third week on this. This is from Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4, the healing of the lame beggar. And we know this story so well, so I don't want to go back. If you say, what story? Then I encourage you to go to the book of Acts and read chapters 3, and we're going to get into chapter, uh, we won't go into chapter 4 this morning. We'll get into chapter 4 the next time. But we look again at the healing of the lame beggar. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. Jesus has commissioned his disciples. He has called them to go forth in his name. He has told them, this is what I want you to do. And then he has said, and this is how you're going to do it. It's going to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, the only way you and I will be able to do what God has called us to do is in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the boss. He's the boss. He's the leader. He's the one who guides. He's the one who directs. And if you and I are not submitted to the Holy Spirit and His work in our lives and through our lives, we will get nowhere with God. We will go nowhere in His work. It must be through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we want to look at power, slide two. And we talked about this last time. The power comes through the Holy Spirit. It is not through my own goodness. It is not through my own effort. It is not through my own perseverance. And all of these things God can use as we work for Him, as we persevere with Him, and we are to persevere. But the power to do what God has called you to do the power to live as God has called you to live is only through the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. And if you are struggling in areas of your Christian life, in yourself 
or in doing the work of the Lord, submit yourself to God. Come before Him. Acknowledge, oh God, I cannot do what you've called me to do in myself. God, I cannot be what you have called me to be in myself. Oh Holy Spirit, come and take control of my life. Oh Holy Spirit, come and take care of these areas of my life where I'm failing and where I'm falling short. And then you will begin to see a difference in what is going on in your life and what, in, what is happening through your life. Peter says in Acts 3, 6, and we look at this verse next, as the lame man looks at him and he's expecting to receive something, he's expecting to receive silver or gold, and we talked about this last week, silver and gold are the currencies of this world. Silver and gold are the things that bring power and influence and authority and position in this world, but they are not the things of God. Now there's nothing wrong with silver or gold. There's nothing wrong with having plenty of money in your pocket or in your bank account. But if you do have plenty of money in your bank account, if you do have plenty of money in your pocket, you better make sure that it's submitted to the control of the Holy Spirit or it will lead you down the wrong path. And the Bible tells us that very, very clearly. And so Peter says, I don't have silver or gold. That lame man has no idea of being helped by God on that day. He's thinking a little silver or gold is just what I need. And brothers and sisters, we live in a world full of people that a lot of times don't really know what they need. They have needs, but they see their needs at a certain level and they don't understand the greater needs that they have in their lives. And that is why you and I are called to live for God in a world that does not know Him. That people might see something in the way that we live. That people might see something in the words that we speak. That people might see something in the deeds that we do. And there might be a hunger in them for something that you have that they don't yet have. And then they will begin to see, oh, I have a greater need. I thought this is what I need, but I see something in that person. How many of you, let me ask you this, how many of you, before you were a Christian, you saw someone who was a Christian, a real Christian, and you saw something in that person's life, and you had questions. What does that person have? Why is that person happy? What is different about that person? They're not rich. They don't have this. They don't have that. What is it? And somebody else's life started to raise questions in your own life and you began to be pointed towards God. That is the only way, that's the only way that we're going to be able to point people towards God. And so Peter says, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. And we talked about this both Sundays before. When he says in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, he is not saying a little ritual or a little formula. Sometimes people say that, don't they? Sometimes people do that. It's almost like a, a, a little magic thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, if I say Jesus, then, then it will be okay. If I do something, it will be okay. If I make the sign of the cross, and I, I'm not... Please understand, I'm not making fun of any of these things, but you and I must understand that the power of Jesus Christ available to you and to me is not just because I say something, not just because I do something. The power of Jesus Christ is available to you and me in my life and through my life when you and I, when we are submitted to God, when we are full of the Holy Spirit, and when He is in control and not we ourselves are in control. That that's when things happen. Then when he's in control, he can lead us. He can guide us. He can say, go here and do that. And you may say, well, I haven't heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. I haven't felt this big revelation. I haven't seen this or I haven't seen that. But how many of you have just felt, I should do this? I should go there. I was talking with some people last week that shared something very simple. They were able to share a meal with a, with a, a woman who was digging through a garbage can just because they had saved some food from an earlier meal. 
Now, I'll bet they didn't hear God say, save that food. I'm going to use you to bless somebody later today. So take it around all day long. That's not usually how God works. God is looking for people, for his still small voice, who will just be full of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when God leads us, it may not even feel like God. It may just feel like I'm doing something. This is what I should do. But nevertheless, it is God. And he will bless people through us as we listen to him. And so what do we see next? Acts 3, 7 and 8, Peter took the lame man by the right hand. Now, if you are, if you are very uh, uh, careful with details, you will see that I put this slide the wrong way. I should have flipped it around backwards because as you can see, this is a left hand, isn't it? I should have flipped it around and then, you would have, then it would have looked like a right hand that was grabbing. To me it's really interesting and, and for me this is one of the things that reminds me that the Bible is true. Dr. Luke, who is the one who writes the gospel, the, the book of Acts, Dr. Luke says he took him by his right hand. And I want us to see this. He uses medical terms here. He took the layman by the right hand and helped him up. Now I want you to notice something. Do you think when Peter took his hand out, do you think that layman kind of sat there like that and Peter had to reach over and say, now give me your hand? No. I want us to see something here. Peter took his right hand. And what that says to me is, Peter reached down, the lame man reached up, and God met them at that moment, at that instance. And brothers and sisters, that is still how God works today. You do your part. God will do his part. But sometimes you and I just sit around and say, okay, God, will you do it? Lord, you just do it all. But God works with his people. God works with his people. And God does his part. Peter does his part, the lame man does his part, and that's the way that God works. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. God works in many different ways, brothers and sisters, but there are times when God is looking for a step an action of faith in your life and in my life. Because this says that as Peter took the lame man, as the lame man took his hand, at that minute, instantly, his feet and ankles were healed and strengthened. So we see a movement of faith. We see a step of faith. It is not arrogance. It is not presumption. But it is a response to God. Faith begins to grow. How, how big? How large? We don't know. How small? We don't know. But there was a movement there was a movement. And I believe that if that layman had thought, God's not going to heal me, and Peter's just going to grab me up and try to make me get up and walk, he wouldn't have raised his hand. But the layman takes a step of faith, a step of faith before he's able to walk, right? And he moves his arm. He moves what he's able to move, and he moves towards God. And Peter does his part. And that's so beautiful, brothers and sisters, because the way that God works in this earth and the way that his love and his care and his power is expressed to people today is through you and me. It is through your hands. It is through my hands. We pray, oh God, love. Oh God, do. And God does work in ways that we don't always understand. But primarily, brothers and sisters, God works through your hands. God works through your mouth. God works through your heart of love that is expressed to people. And we see that here. We see that here. And he does that if, with anybody of any age. I don't care what age you are this morning here in this church. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. This is how God works. So they do their part. His feet and his ankles are strengthened and then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. This is the first time he's ever been able to go into the temple. He was never able to go into the temple before then. And then I want us to look at a verse, and, and this is so wonderful. We look at Isaiah. So it says, walking and leaping and praising God. And then we go all the way back to the Old Testament and Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, and look at this and be encouraged today. And when he comes, who? Messiah. Messiah. When Messiah comes, he will 
open the eyes of the blind, unplug the ears of the deaf, and then look at verse 6. The lame will what? <laughs> Leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Brothers and sisters, when Messiah comes, this is what happens in your situation, in your life, in your condition, in your brokenness. Let Messiah come into your life. And when he does, what is broken will be repaired. When he does, what is downhearted will look up. When he does, what is discouraged will be encouraged. When he does, what is lame will be able to walk. That is what Messiah does. That is why Jesus has come. Let him come again into your life, into your situation as he did for that man because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to think about this for just a minute. What a commotion that must have been. We see this in Isaiah, and then we go back again, go back again to Acts uh, 3, the verses that we just read, back up to that slide. Walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Back up just a minute. There we go. Walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple. And I want you to think for just a minute about what that was like as it happened. It was not quiet. It was was exuberant. It was overflowing. It was loud. And I want to tell you something this morning, brothers and sisters. There are times when you and I, in our responses to God, need to be just like this lame man, need to be open-hearted and exuberant and overflowing in our praises to the Lord. I'm not saying, oh, you make an idiot of yourself or you make a fool of yourself or you make a, a commotion and, and, and people say, why are they acting so crazy? That's not it. It's not something that you make up. It's not something that you, oh, well, I better do this. But brothers and sisters, the Lord is looking for a response, a true response, a heart response from you and from me. And when he receives that, he is honored and he's praised and he's glorified. Because if that man had said, oh, thank you so much for healing me. I'm so glad. What happened next would not have happened. It wouldn't have happened. And we see what happened next. Acts 3, 9 and 11. All the people. Some of the people? No. All the people. Why was it all the people? Why? Because it was exuberant. Because it was, exuberant. Because it was loud. Because he was doing what? He was jumping. He was leaping. He was praising God. You couldn't help but notice him. You couldn't help but notice him. And when, so they look first and they're probably saying, who is making so much noise? Who is causing a commotion? Who is disturbing our set way of doing things? It's time for prayer. Shh, be quiet. But he was leaping and praising God because here was a man who for 40 years had never known what it was to stand on his feet. He'd never known because it was from birth. And God, Messiah, had come into his heart and come into his life. And so he draws attention. And then what happens next? When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were what? Absolutely astounded. And they all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade. Here's this fancy word. Do you know an easy word for colonnade? Porch. <laughs> okay, porch. There's a church over on the island that's called what? Do you know what it's called? Solomon's Porch, right? It's a, it's a I think, a Korean-American church and others as well. It's the same thing. Solomon's colonnade, Solomon's porch. Do you remember Jesus on the last day of the feast when the water was being poured out and then he said, he called to people and he said, oh, everyone that's thirsty, come to me and well, uh, well, wells of water will spring up from within you. This is where Jesus was and it was a very large place. So it's just Solomon's porch. And they all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's, oh, back up please. Don't get ahead of me, thank you. Where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Now he's holding on to them because they're the instruments through whom God has used. But I want us to see something here. And I want us to see now more about God's purpose and timing. And timing in all of this. We've said it before. It is doubtless that Jesus and his disciples walked by him before. Doubtless. Doubtless. And Jesus had never touched 
that man and brought healing to that man before. Jesus goes back to heaven, sends the Holy Spirit, and his disciples are there. And now we begin to see something here. Why does this happen in this way? Listen carefully. God's timing, God's timing, and I want you to think about your own life as you look at this. God's timing is just as important as his will in every situation, in every life. I want to say it again. God's timing is just as important as His will. Because you're praying about things. God may have spoken something to your heart and you are wondering, well, why hasn't it happened? God, where are you? What's going on? Wait for God's timing because it's just as important as His will. And often when God leads us, He does not explain everything, does He? Have you ever wanted God to explain everything to you? I have. God, if you will just tell me why, then I'll understand and I can accept it. But God often does not explain. Why? Because God is calling us to obedience and faith before explanation and understanding. Let me say it one more time. God calls us to obedience and faith before explanation and understanding because God is a God of faith. Remember what all the way back in the Old Testament, Abraham walked with God. Remember what God said to Abraham? He said, Abraham, follow me and I will show you. And so what did it, requ what did it require of Abraham? What it required, he had God's promise, God, I will show you. But what, and God said, I will be with you and I will take you and I will show you a place I'm going to give to you. But that was God's promise. What did it require of Abraham? It required a step of faith and it required that Abraham stay close with God and stay in close relationship with God so that God could lead him, so that God could take him to the place that he had for him, so that God could give him that place. And God is still looking for and doing the same thing in your life and my life today. He doesn't explain everything. Although we want him to, our natural minds say, why? How many of you, that's one of the biggest questions you've ever had. Why? Yes? When bad things happen, why? Yes? How, why, God? And sometimes God, I shouldn't say sometimes, most of the time, God does not answer why. But time goes on because God is looking for people who will say, God, I have proven you faithful. God, I have proven you good. God, you've never failed me before now. And so, God, I don't understand. I'm a little bit discouraged. I'm a little bit bewildered. I'm a little bit confu confused. But, God, I am going to hold on to you until you explain, until I understand, until I see what you've done and why you're doing it. That's how God works most of the time. Most of the time. And we see it here. God is always working for the greater good. Now we've talked about power. Let's look at preaching. And this comes next. And we're still talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. How He works. So let's talk about preaching. You say, Pastor Jennifer, power, preaching, persecution, prayer. How long is it going to take us to get all the way to prayer? We're going to we're going to start moving faster now. I wanted to spend more time on this first part. So we look at this next part, and we're still talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Let's see what happens next. Acts 3, 12 through 15. Look with me at this. And I want you to see the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. How does it begin? How does it begin? Peter what? saw his opportunity. I want you to stop right there. Uh, and he addressed the crowd. So Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. Now I want you to understand something and see something about the work and the power and the, the, how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. When your life is full of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is in charge of you, when the Holy Spirit is in charge of me, let me tell you what He will do. He will open your eyes to opportunities. He will open your eyes to opportunities. I've given you this 
example before, but I want to remind you of this again as we look at this. He saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd. And here comes the preaching. And you may say, well, I'm not a preacher like Peter. Well, I'm not a preacher like Peter either. But God has called each one of us to proclaim the gospel and to proclaim the truth. And so Peter saw his opportunity. When I read this, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something that happened in my life many, many years ago. Uh, it was maybe 1990. Two? A long time ago. That was before Gloria was born. It was before Sam was born too, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm really old. It was certainly before David and Joshua and, and all the rest of you and, and, and Anne-Marie and Josh and Nat and Nat were born. It was a long time ago. I was young then and I was in Beijing. I was at Peking University. I was teaching. And um, I, I was a, so I was a teacher in the English department, and I happened to one evening for dinner. I didn't usually do this, but I went to it, the place was called Xiaoyuan, and it was the foreign students' dining hall. And the foreign students would go there, and some of the foreign teachers would go there as well. You could go to many different places on campus to eat, but this is one of the places. And I walked in, and you know they have they'd have these little those of you that studied in China remember this. You'd 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 line up, and there would be little little glass windows that they'd open and close and you'd stick in your bowl or whatever or you'd have your tray and they'd put food on it um, and you'd tell them what you want and then you'd pay for it or whatever. And so I was standing and it was not very good food by the way but that was a long time ago. And so I was standing in line and it was at a time when I was really tired and it was at a time when I was tired of talking to people about English. I was an English teacher but I was tired of people coming up to me and wanting to practice their English. I, you know, and I lived in a city, uh, in a, a city of more than 8 million, in a country of one, at that time it was 1.1 billion people, and two-thirds of them wanted to learn English. <laughs> okay? And so there I was, I was standing in the cafeteria, and this woman, I think I had met her once before, but I didn't really remember her or whatever. She was younger than I was. She was not a student. I think she was a, a, a young teacher. She came up behind me, and she saw me, and she started talking with me. And I will be really honest with you. In my mind, I thought, oh, brother, another person who wants to speak English. And all I wanted to do was get my food and sit down and eat because I was tired. I didn't have a lot of grace in my heart. I didn't have a lot of mercy in my heart. And the woman started talking with me and she said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I want to be really honest with you. In my heart, I thought, I didn't say, yay, praise the Lord. And I had gone to China to tell people about Jesus. In my heart, I thought, another one who wants to pretend to be interested in religion so that they can practice their English. I'm being honest with you. That's what, I, that's what I felt. That's what I felt. And she started asking me questions about God. And you know what I did? I turned her off. I, I wasn't unkind, but I just turned her off and I changed the conversation because I was tired and I just thought, she just wants to practice her English. She's not interested in God. And I took my tray and I went and I sat down to eat. About a week later, I went back to the, student, to the foreign student's cafeteria. And this, this had, had been on maybe a Thursday. And this was next week. And she saw me. And she came running up to me. And I thought, again? <laughs> and her face was beaming with joy. You know what she said to me? She said, oh, hi, Jennifer, I just want to let you know, I, I went to church on Sunday. There was a church in, in, in Haidian, in that district. It was a three-self church. It was a, it was a communist-run government church. And she said, I went to that church in Haidian, and you know what? I gave my heart to Jesus, and I've become a Christian. This is a true story. And as I looked at that, I thought, oh, God. And I was so convicted. And I didn't say it to her. And to her, I congratulated her. And I said, oh, praise the Lord. And I rejoiced with her. But let me tell you what I thought as I went back to my room. What I thought about myself and what I saw. And as I looked at this was this.
At that moment, I missed the opportunity that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords put into my hands at that moment. I had the privilege, I had the opportunity, I had the responsibility to tell this person to be aware of and to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and to be submitted to the Holy Spirit so that my eyes would be open, so that my ears would be open, so that my heart would be ready for the opportunity that the Holy Spirit was giving me to tell this woman who was so hungry and who was going to die and go to hell if she didn't meet Jesus to tell her about Jesus, to introduce her to the author of life. And she had come up to me looking for that and hoping for that. And I missed it. I missed it. Why? Because I wasn't submitted to the Holy Spirit. I was full of Jennifer. I was tired. I was this. I was that. And I lost the opportunity that God had given me. Oh, what a wonderful, what joy I would have had if I had been able to lead her to the Lord. Thank the Lord that she was so hungry that God protected her heart and led her even to a government church where she met Jesus. Because if it had been up to me, she wouldn't have met Jesus. When you and I, under the control of the Holy Spirit, He will give us opportunities. We will see what God wants us to see. I've told you the story before about my sister who, whose car broke down. This was a few years ago. Her car broke down at rush hour time. This was back in the U.S. And she was frustrated because it was busy. And, and you know what? People always stop to help other people in the hometown I'm from. It's a small town. Not many people. If somebody breaks down on the road, somebody always stops. They'll always drive you somewhere. And people drove by, drove by, and drove by. Not a single person stopped. And so my sister had to get out, had to walk across the highway, and had to go over and find a car, a repair place. And remember, I've told you this story before. As she went in and as she stood there, she overheard a man talking to somebody else about his hopelessness. And God touched her heart. And God opened her eyes because she was in the place where God could and opened her eyes to the opportunity. And she shared Jesus with him and he accepted the Lord. And then he told her, if you had not come in and if you had not talked to me and told me about Jesus just now, I was going to go home tonight and take my life because I, my life is hopeless. That's what he was going to do. Brothers and sisters, people all around us need God. And God is looking for His people. And God is waiting for His people to say, God, here I am. God, I submit myself to you. God, I'm ready to be used by you for your purposes. Not for my own purposes. Not for what makes me happy. Not for what is convenient for me. And I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. A lot of times when we are used by God, and I want to be really honest with you, listen carefully. It will not be very convenient for you. Yes or no? You've heard Pastor Renee and Sister Bridget talk about the early years of their Christianity when God saved them out of drugs and oh, all sorts of a lifestyle. And talk with them sometime more about how God used them. Because they took other desperate people, they took hippies, they took drug addicts into their home, they lived with them, they would take them to eat, they'd cook for them, they'd take them out for coffee. It wasn't convenient, was it? sometimes. It was messy sometimes. It cost money sometimes. It disrupted schedules sometimes. But what a small price to pay for God's work to be carried out in this earth. What a small price to pay for people to be pulled out of darkness and brought into life. And Peter saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd. Now I want you to see something here as Peter addresses the crowd. And you can look at it. I'm not going to go into all of it. But I want you to see what happens as he preaches. First of all, he's very clear and he lets them know it's not because we're so holy. You see that? He says, what's so surprising? Why stare at us as though 
we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness. That's what the Jews thought. The Jews thought that God would have to notice somebody who was very spiritual and very holy, and then he would help them do things. That's, and, the, and you know what? That's what we think sometimes too, isn't it? If I'm really, really good, God will have to do something. God will have to do something. That's not how God works. That's not how God works. And then he says, verse 13, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. Now look really carefully at this. He was speaking to a Jewish crowd and to a religious Jewish crowd. And so his sermon is very Jewish, okay? His sermon is very Jewish. May I encourage you, as you are sharing Jesus, that unless you are talking to a Jew, you probably don't want to say, I want you to know it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that has done this. No. Be appropriate to the situation. Be appropriate to, to the people that you're talking to. And he points them to Jesus. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. The work of the Holy Spirit will always point people to Jesus. He'll always point people to Jesus. The old Peter would have said, Ooh, I'm so great. I'm so holy. Look at me. Look at me. The new Peter says, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. And I want to bring a word of encouragement to you. He says, this is God. This is through God and this is by Jesus. And then I want you to see something else right here. He says, this is the same Jesus whom you handed over, you rejected before Pilate, Pilate wanted to release him, you rejected this holy righteous one and you demanded the release of a murderer. Now look at verse 15. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this fact. And it's time to stop. We've got about two more minutes. But would you meditate? I'm going to go just a little bit longer. I've got two more minutes. Would you meditate and think on this? And I want you to see what Peter is doing here. And I want to ask you a question. Because you know, when we talk with people about Jesus, it doesn't do any good to condemn people, right? Does it, does it help to say, you're really bad. You're really a sinner. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Does that help at all in any way? Has that been a successful way to bring people to Jesus? Never! So what is Peter doing here? Now we know the end of the story and we know that many, many people, at least 2,000 more men only, we don't know how many women and children became Christians because of this. 2,000 more. 2,000 more. That's a huge response to a very, very strong sermon. So what's going on here? I encourage you between now and next week to read the rest of the sermon yourself and start thinking about it. Because what type of sermon is Peter preaching? But I want to say one thing as we come to a close. I want you to see that as Peter finishes this part, he says, we are witnesses of this fact. And we're going to touch on this next week, but I want to touch on it right now as well as we come to a close. You and I, as we share Jesus, should study. You should know scriptures. You should study. If you're trying to reach Muslims, you need to pray and you need to learn what is it that Muslims believe. If you're trying to reach a Buddhist, you need to find out about it. You need to study things. You need to know. But I want to tell you something that's more important than all of the studying that you and I do when we talk about Jesus with people. We are witnesses of this fact. And every time you share Jesus with someone, and every time you talk with someone about Jesus, make sure that your testimony is part of it that your life is part of it. Because people will see something real and people will feel something real when you say, and this is what Jesus has done for me. This is the difference He made in my life. This is what God has done. Have you seen somebody raised from the dead? I have not. Have you seen a lame man brought to his feet and able to walk? I've not. Let me tell you what I have seen. I have seen a selfish, self-centered, proud person who was doing her own thing changed and her life brought under the control of God. And I'm talking about me. We are witnesses of the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Amen. Let's close in prayer this morning. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we come to you this morning. And Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that Peter and John were under your control and led by your Holy Spirit to see the opportunities that were available to them. Father, may the same thing be true of us. Lord, may we too be ready and in the place where our eyes are open to see people around us that are ready to hear your word, that are ready to receive your hope, that are ready to have your light shine in their lives, that are ready to turn from the ways they are going and walk in your ways instead. Give us eyes to see the opportunities that you have before us. This week we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you.